Welcome to another brand new episode of Learning As I Go. And I'm so excited about this episode because I've got one of my best friends in front of me. But not only that, he's had a phenomenal career. He started off as a child star in Combination Street at the age of 13, then went on to win a massive TV show called Soap Star Superstar, leading him to go on tour with the likes of Elton John, perform with Sting, starring the West End and Broadway, and multiple shows right now on Netflix, including The Sandman. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Fleishman. Right, where do we start, Richard Fleishman, on my podcast? Thomas, I'm on your podcast. I've made it to the big leagues, I'm buzzing. <laughs> Me too. Do you know what, I'm actually, I was actually thinking about this before, like, when did I stop being starstruck by you? Because literally, I don't, I actually don't, I actually don't know if you know this, but obviously, I met you through Ryan because Ryan was in Coronation Street at the time, yeah. and and you were in Corrie from such a young age, and I met you through Ryan, and you were this fifteen-year-old, um, boffy haired He's younger than that man. No, was it younger than that? Yeah, thirteen when I met you. No, was it thirteen? Oh no, when no. I met you in Blackpool, that time was fourteen. Yeah, so yeah. you're fourteen, and I met you, and I literally, and then you wanted to start hanging around with me, and <laughs> I was so starstruck, like literally, because you got to remember, like being right, Ryan was in Corrie, right, and he he was living his life, but I was literally just a very normal guy who was experienced being around famous people for the first time, and you don't even know this, but I was every time I was with you, I was starstruck. That's like, hilarious. Because you got to remember, like how big Corrie was. Yeah, it was huge. Like the viewing figures were crazy. Well, it was a different time because back then. I know it's mad to say, but back then, there wasn't the options there is now. There was no YouTube. There was no, like, reality streaming. There's no reality TV. It was like you watched the four, maybe five channels terrestrial, and if you had Sky, maybe flicking and out of that, but the viewing figures on the, the shows then, the soaps then, which is You were crazy. a big star, man, from the age of 13. So, like, talk to me about that process then. How did you get the job in Corrie? How did that all start? How did you fall into acting? So, that was a weird one. So, I, 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 um, I got the audition just because they put the casting net so wide because they needed a new family. I was obviously in the catchment. I'm kind of the right age. I was known to the casting director, I think, because uh, I'd done an advert or audition for an advert before that. And um, I remember my mum and dad were like, go along, it'll be a fun day, you know, never thinking anything would come from it. So I went along and it went well, I must have done. And uh, a few weeks later, it was like, oh, you got a call back. And again, my mum and dad, they've been actors the whole life. They were like, oh, listen, that's lovely. Go along, have a nice time, enjoy it. Never going to go anywhere. So then I did the next one. And then we never heard for months, uh, literally months. And we went away to Orlando in Florida to Walt Disney World and got a call then to say, we've cast the parents. Would he come back in and read with the parents? Wow. And I was like, it's still going. So my mom and dad said so I went in again and it, that went well. And then I got a final recall, which is about six months later, to say it was just me and this other lad. We were on the set, on the, you know, place we were going to be as a family with the parents I think Lucy Joe was still auditioning who played my sister or right. she might have been in a another couple as well I can't remember I think we were auditioning with a couple of others and I knew it was just me and this other lad and there was that weird moment of being on the sofa outside and being like one of our lives head head. is about to, about to change, change yeah. you know and then to be that young to do 12 and going through those kind of thoughts is quite quite weird and um my mom and dad sat me down the night before that and they said you really need to be sure if, if you want to do this because they never dreamt it was going to get that far. They thought, because just statistically, it's yeah. probably improbable, you know. And they just said, if you really want to commit to this, it might change a few things and you need to be aware of that. And I was just 12. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then, uh, yeah, lo and behold, I got it. But like, just to put it into context, like being on Colony Street as a school kid, yeah. Like that was must have been mind blowing because you were like very famous from such an early age. And obviously you've been around it because obviously your parents were from the industry. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, your mum played Jackie Corkill in, in Brookside, which is iconic. And your dad's obviously a really um, established actor. Yeah. But at the same time, it's for you to experience that at such an early age. How do you feel like that kind of impacted your life? I think the weird thing about being any experience that you're going through personally and also being a kid. So it's like twofold. I think when you personally experience something, you generally don't realize how it just becomes normal because mm -hmm. it's your lived experience. So that was my lived experience at 12 years old. I was just suddenly going through these feelings and these, and, and these experiences and not really able to fully compute what was going on probably. And as well, when you're a kid, 
you're just so adaptable. So you're just like, oh, this is, you know, whatever. Oh, so it's like it's normal. It's, uh, yeah, it's just normal. Right, you yeah. know, and a pe people used to say up until the age of 12, they were like, what's it like having two parents who are actors? And I would say, well, what's it like having two parents who are plumbers and accountants? I, that's just what my parents are. It's mm -hmm. not like if you said to, I don't know, Brooklyn Beckham, what's it like having David Beckham as your dad? I don't know. That's my dad. Do you right, know what I mean? Okay, okay. You can't, you can't visualize anything other. That was just my normal. But again, probably like anything, any experience you go through, as you get older and you, you kind of look back on that experience with 2020 vision in hindsight, it was a very weird <laughs> way to, to spend your It was the best. <laughs> it's, because cause it, it throws up, as well as all the amazing, I know we're gonna go into that, <laughs> it does throw up some amazing things. Like we, we yeah. got this carte blanche to go and have amazing times and probably get a little bit more leash than I, was, I, I should have had at, a, at such a young age. And you have a bit of money in your back pocket so you can actually go and enjoy stuff, which was amazing. But I also have vivid memories of being so nervous about going out in public on my own. Because mm -hmm. if you're, you're 13 and you're 14, you think, well, you, your neurosis kicks in. And you think everyone is looking at me and everyone's judging me. But when you get a bit older, you go, oh, I was just a teenager. They weren't. But <laughs> they really were. Yeah, they, Do you know they what were. I mean? They actually were. Yeah. And I'd walk, I remember being in the traffic center or places like that. And I was a kid and I'd be on my own. And I'd see like a gang of young lads walking towards me and, and I'd panic because I think one of them's gonna recognize me and then there's gonna, they're gonna start saying stuff. So that was nerve wracking. Or there'd be a gang of young girls coming and then it'd be like, and they're gonna get weird. And then, I'd, and I'd just get so nervous about that whole, and that, that's something I've only really started to analyze as I got a bit older, that actually that's not necessarily the normal way of coming up, but that's just, that was what happened for me. So yeah. it was kind of, it's the balance of going, yeah, there was amazing things, but also, it was tough to And you're completely with. right, though, because people did change around you. Like, I remember even, even if I went to a party and people caught on to that I was Ryan's brother, the whole atmosphere changed. Like, the way I got treated was yeah. on a new level. And let's talk about it, because obviously you quickly became, like, our fourth brother. <laughs> like, literally, um, the fourth Thomas. And Ryan pretty much took you under his wing, as well as us. And he was taking us out in Manchester. And we were living this, like, rock star life. <laughs> like, literally going out at 15 with, like, oversized blazers. The bl pinstripe blazers. Pinstripe blazers. Oh, my God, they were horrific. <laughs> going to, like, baby ground, sitting in the VIP. We must have looked 12. Oh, we must have looked like idiots. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't, to this day, imagine how any bouncer seriously allowed us to go in but we, it was a different time i guess you know and and uh i see some of those pictures now and we just look like kids i mean we were kids but it's it's hilarious but i mean we had the best but time like you said it was a different time and we lived a, an incredible life but sort of always behind the combination street fame and your acting career which not many people knew apart from the people closest to you at the time was this incredible musical talent that you had like you could play any instrument from a, like an early age like the piano the guitar and we used to see it like behind closed doors when we come around to you i was just talking before about coming around to your mum and dad's house and they had this grand piano and i walked in and i'd and i've never seen anything like it before where i'd sit down and not only you were this really talented actor you'd just be sitting there just playing any scott what's on you want me to play and you could just play it off air and I was just like, what's going on? This guy is the most talented guy I've ever met. And then there, there was certain occasions, like, for example, we used to go to the press club in Manchester and there was a certain time when it'd be like a, it was a karaoke bar, wasn't it? And then literally you would get up and sing on this karaoke bar and everyone just used to think it was just drunk people having a good time. And then they'd stop and be like, who is this superstar? Like, we, like I'm even getting tingles now thinking about it. Like, you've been so talented from such an early age it's with so many different things, but music has always been a massive passion for you like mm. and you got put into this category of being an actor but really music has always been the heart of what you do am i right in saying that or well it's weird i mean this is a question that's kind of cropped up so many times because i think i do i do the same thing when when i look at people's careers we like to pigeonhole and we like mm. to go like what are you you know but i don't think being a musician makes me any less of an actor and i don't think being a, an actor makes me any less of a musician i hope that they can run alongside one another and the really, the really lucky position I've found myself in is that one has now, one has started to benefit the other. So I've been getting opportunities where because I can sing or because I can play an instrument, I've got that job or, you know, this was helped by my understanding of this right. or whatever. And so that's been great. But I've always really tried hard to avoid pigeonholing myself just because as I've gone through this, like the last 20 years, 21 years now that's been 
since I started doing this crazy <laughs> business. Um, the, the opportunities that have been most rewarding and the most exciting for me have always been the, the ones that have blindsided me, that I wasn't, mm. that weren't really on my radar, or if there was a job I was like, oh, I have to get that, and then something's dropped in from the left side, I've gone, oh, maybe, and then that thing's been the thing that's ended up changing my life and taking me to a different country and, and been this crazy, uh, crazy experience. So I've sort of, I, I've run away a little bit from, from trying to be pigeonholed, but also from pigeonholing myself. There's a serious level of talent there that I always call you the wonder boy. Like literally, <laughs> Rick's one of those guys you can just do anything. Like he's just so annoying. Well, I think maybe I'm skipping an important bit because I became obsessed. Like I became obsessed with piano. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, that looks fun. I'll just right. do it. I, w there was always a joke where we find Richard if he's not at school and he's not on set. I'm sat behind the piano. Now I'm we're like, getting there. And okay. the first, the first thing I ever bought, I remember going into school and everyone was like, what are you gonna do with the first paycheck you get? You know. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to buy a PlayStation chair. I remember one kid said that. I was like, what's a PlayStation chair? When it vibrates. I was like, no, I don't want that. He said, what are you getting? I said, I'm buying a, a baby grand piano. Oh, you did? And uh, and they all were like, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was just, I was, that's what I want. And so uh, I saved up and I went and chose this baby grand piano, which my mom and dad still have in their house today. And uh, it was just my pride and joy. And so we got rid of the little upright that I'd spent years plonking away on. And then that just became my absolute obsession when I finished school or whatever. I was just there for, for hours and, and that was where. Here's I a question for you. So at that moment, were you thinking about the bigger picture? Were you thinking about becoming, I don't know, like a, a superstar musician or were you just doing it because you loved it? Purely for the love. I always, wow. I always, to be honest with you, because I was already doing something that ha gave me a lot of uh, feedback, mm. a lot of public attention. That was just for you? Yeah, the, 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 I always say like, when people say, oh, I want to do this, you know, especially now as I've got to an age where sometimes people do ask advice, like young actors or young musicians or whatever, it just in passing conversation, might say like, what, how would you go about this? Or how did you go about this? And I always think, well, just what's your why? Like, what's the reason you want to do this thing? Because my why was never fame because I'd experienced it growing up with my mum. My mum's an inherently private person. So the attention she got, I always saw her not necessarily hugely comfortable with it. She just wanted to be an actress from when she was a kid and she became an actress. And with that came this sort of burden of fame, which she was highly uncomfortable with. And, um, and then the baton got passed to me when I was sort of 12, 13. And I would be lying to sit here and say like, oh, pass me the tiny violin. You know, there's some great perks to fame or there was back then. But I, I would definitely say that that comes with a huge unwanted burden, which at a young age especially is not necessarily easy to handle. And with the way the world's gone, with the way social media, the way the press intrusion, the way that everything's so immediate now, that, that burden of fame has only got worse, I think. Mm. And it's so hard to navigate. And so the commodity of fame as well, years ago, it used to be something to I think used to be aspirational, like the Frank Sinatra's, the Marilyn Monroe's, the Gene Kelly's, they had this enigma about them. There was something, because they'd achieved the extraordinary, they were classed as extraordinary mm. people. And that was where their fame came from. Whereas now there's, there's so many levels to what we class as famous. You can go on a reality it, show and get nearly a million followers. Right, or, or even more so, you can open presents as, as Adam. I went for dinner with Adam last night and, and Teddy was showing me this guy on TikTok. Now, I don't have TikTok, but he was showing me this guy who like points at stuff. And he's got, and I went, but what does he do? He, went, <laughs> he, he points at stuff. I said, okay, that's his thing. I went, so, and he went, he's the most followed person in the world. He's got like, I, th I think, I'm saying off the top of my head, I think he's got 150 million TikTok Whoa. followers, right? And he, apparently he points at stuff. I, my mind was blown, right? Yeah. And so I'm not saying there's anything, I'm not being derogatory in any way, shape or form. It's just that the nature of that has all changed. The nature of the beast has changed. So, so the commodity of fame never really interests so me. So when you talk about knowing what your why is, and I've read the book um, from Simon Sinek, like what is your why? And I get it, everyone talks about it. But then actually identifying and finding out what that is, I think is not straightforward. Did you know what your why was from day one or? No, definitely not. Like, it, I think it's easier to say what it's not. I think it's always easier for me um, to know. I, I have a quite a strong gut reaction to, to jobs and I've had that since I was a kid. Yeah, so, you have. So I've not necessarily known where my career was gonna take me. I've not necessarily known what 
I'd be like, this would be great. But I've always known what I didn't want to do. That is so true about you. I was about to say, like, even from day one, like, you've never, you've never sold out. You've never sold out who you are. You've not necessarily told me what your brand is or who you want to be, but you've kind of been very clear about who you're not and, and what opportunities yeah. to say no to. And that kind of leads us on to, for example, for us, you were this, like, hidden superstar behind the closed doors that like we only always really experienced at these like um, private events or after parties where you'd sing and show this amazing talent. But then obviously this opportunity came up where you were in Corrie and the show um, came around called Soap Star Superstar, yeah. which was a massive show at the time. And oh, I can't, I've got tingles again, goosebumps, because I came to watch it in the audience and I remember when you sang Mr. Bojangles and I would literally watch that on repeat on my own. In fact, I think I sent it to you recently. You did I? send it recently. <laughs> that was so weird. <laughs> but like, I was so proud to watch it. And you just were on this massive platform, center stage on this big um, ITV primetime show. And you won it. And you showed the world how incredibly musically talented you were, as, le as well as acting. And that kind of put you off into a different kind of strat stratosphere in terms yeah. of music, right? And obviously you, you did that big show and then so many different opportunities started to come your way. And don't quote me on this, but I feel like I heard that Simon Cowell tried to sign you. Or there was some, yeah. There's rumors around that. But and you, and you said you were saying no to so many different opportunities because you knew straight away that you didn't want to go down like the X Factor route or the commercial route. Yeah. You, you still, you kind of knew who you were. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, again, it, with 2020 vision in hindsight, it's, it's a really difficult one because I'd, I'd, I'd experienced the, the soap fame at a young age, which is a which is a really searing, powerful uh, spotlight to have, um, but things went into a whole other gear uh, after I did that show, and and my and I'll be honest, I took a bit of persuading to do that show, and mm. it was only friends and and my mom and sort of colleagues and stuff, and I think maybe even we had a conversation. We're like, well, look, you do all this thing, you love it, and nobody knows. <laughs> you, you're not showing anyone you can do it, and this is a perfect platform, and um, so eventually I did it, and it and it was an amazing experience, and. It's, it was when I was 16, so like, what are we going back? I mean, like 16 years or something. Wow. And uh, it was before even X Factor. It was like when we were in Pop oh Idol stage. Was it? Yeah, it was like really early doors. No it was, way. I think it was a year before like Leona Lewis won no X Factor. Way. So we're going way back. So the whole format was so unique and it got, it even it was, I think it was like 12 shows, but it just got huge. And all of a sudden that put me into a whole other level of attention, which then I felt really, uneasy with because then I was like tabloid fodder but I had people camped outside the house um, I found out in in later years that I would, I'd been uh, targeted as, as many people had by the press and wow. had my phone hacked and things like that and that's not stuff that you should be dealing with when you're 16 years old when mm. you're starting to mistrust family members when you're starting to question friendships and things and um, I remember a day at Stockport train station. I was dr I was on my way down, and it was a really exciting time. Again, I have to like caveat all of this stuff. It was amazing, but as with anything in life, it's th there's a tax. You know, you can't just have it all sunshine and roses. Mm. There's for every for every up, there's going to be a down. And the down to this was I was on my way down to to meet a record company who wanted to to have a meeting, which was hugely exciting. And I went in to Stockport train station into the little uh, like news agents bit. And my face was on every single one of the gossip magazines in some way or form, like I spotted or, you know, we had Heat magazine and stuff yeah. back then, like before Twitter, you know Torso what I mean? of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't Torso <laughs> of the week back then. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, I remember I called my mum and I just said, I need to put the brakes on everything for a little bit. I can't, this is not for me. I, I don't want this. And there was a few opportunities that came along in, in, in the immediate wake of that show that I ended up walking away from. Which probably now, sitting here as a, in my 30s, looking back and going, that would have actually been amazing. Do you know what I mean? To have done those TV shows or had my own show or whatever. But at the time, I just couldn't face it. So I just knew that that had taken me off into a, a place where that level of fame was just too hard to, to navigate. And uh, All right, so it wasn't necessarily the opportunities that you were staying away from. It was that level of fame that you felt... It, it was a bit of both, right. I'll be honest. Like I always had an eye of thinking... So I, I was always completely against doing anything that, because I'd already, don't forget, come from Coronation Street, mm. which as wonderful as Coronation Street is, and it's an institution, it, in the eyes of the business, in the bigger eyes of the business, it's got connotations to it, which can, you hold don't you back. can hold you back. So I was quite aware of that. So when I decided to leave when I was 17, 16, 17, 
And a lot of people were saying, you're stupid, you know, because a lot of people do leave that show and, and, and the ghost of that show is too hard to shed. You typecast a lot of the time. Sure. And I was, I was like adamant that if I leave while I'm still considered a kid, which I was 16, that I would be able to, to move on and play other characters, which was what I wanted to do. And, um, and so going into the industry, I knew I was starting at minus three. I wasn't starting at zero. So I knew it was going to be an uphill struggle. And then I did a, it was a, for charity, but it was still a reality show of sorts. Do you know what I mean? And it was a singing reality show. So now I'm at minus five <laughs> in terms of being taken seriously. Right. So when these other opportunities were coming along, as well as me being uncomfortable with the level of attention I was getting, I was also thinking, I haven't got many more minuses to go if I'm going to keep tr keep trying to get back to in the pluses. Where when I you're saying minuses, though, you're talking about the sort of credible, yeah. traditional, like respected actor right do you know what i mean like i it's feel not many not many people for example some people go would have gone from like cory to like footballers wives and seen that as progression whereas you i feel like you did have a, an inkling of your vision because it was more always like almost like the old school traditional credible acting Does i that think make sense? i think maybe what happened was just because m my mom and dad until my mom obviously went into to cory and brookie and brookie became enormous and and was fantastic for my mom and for us all as a family and and, and i witnessed that um, but they would, they've just been theatre actors their whole lives, you know, and they've just done really great theatre and, and obviously like TV series and stuff like that. But the drive for them was the, the passion for the job, playing, getting the chance to play lots of characters and getting feedback on that and being, that a, skill. A, being, yeah, being a rewarded for something rather yeah. than just being rewarded for being yourself. And so I think from an early age, I, I witnessed that. And then going into a show like Corrie, when... I was, I was just hyper aware all the time that it lives in its own world. And I was so immensely grateful to that show because it was the best drama school I could have ever got. You know, there was no messing around. It's, you cannot turn up to a job like that and be late. You can't turn up and not know your lines. You can't turn up and be an idiot. You, there's just no time for it. So it's perfect to cut your teeth on and learn. And there's some amazing actors on those shows. Mm. Like, I'm not being derogatory at all. Mm. I'm just talking about the, the facts of in the wider sort of landscape. Um, but it's interesting you say this now because I was even conscious about us even talking about Corey on this because you've moved on so far. And it's the same with me when I when I first did Love Island for a couple of years, like I was told to stop mentioning it and try and get away from it. Mm. Whereas now I feel like I've hit a bit of a point in my career where I'm quite confident and secure in who I am. So that now I can it. talk, do you know what I mean? Yeah, do you feel like you're the same place? But honestly, maybe only just right, because yeah. only recently I was uh, with my fiance and uh, she literally turned to me and said, do you know what they've just introduced you as? I said, what? They went, Richard Fleishman from Sandman. Oh, wow. And I was like, this is a real moment. Wow. Because as much as um, we may or may not talk about it, I don't know, but I've, I've had a pretty varied career over the last 20 years and I've done a lot of things that many people won't even know about, but to me, they've been pretty big. Certainly, I would consider them bigger than being a, a child actor on Corrie, but you'd be amazed. How many times? <laughs> How many times? But it only makes sense. Like, I to I'm not taking anything away i completely understand why people would because it's it's a huge national institution it makes sense to refer to people from that but yeah exactly wow. it's only now in recent times that actually it's good to kind of i'm fully aware of and i'm incredibly grateful to that show and just for any listeners who, who don't know sandman's one of the biggest shows on netflix now which we'll get to as well but yeah. it just shows how how much you've moved on from a, a national soap to doing some incredible shows but um yeah, so you went and so you went and did this big show. You've got this new level of fame, and then you kind of like um, deliberately removed yourself from that limelight and kind of perfected your craft a little bit. Worked on some music. I know you released some um, great songs like "It's Coming Down," <laughs> like "Chocolate Stars." Check it out, guys. It's a great track. Um, and then talk to me about a bit because I, I, sometimes I get muddled in terms of where your career went after that. So you yeah. you started to release some music, yeah. And then I'm going to jump from that part of your life to then. The West End for me, which was then the, go the launch of Ghost, the musical. That, yeah. for me, but I'm guessing there's some gaps in there. Yeah, so I mean, so I got signed with Universal eventually, and then I was quite pig headed as an 18 year old, and I was like, I'm gonna run, you know, I have to be uber credible because I have to swim against what everyone's gonna uh, expect from me and, and all of this stuff. And I think probably, if I'm entirely honest, some of those decisions were misjudged just because. It's, it's, I guess it's a little bit like if Justin Bieber for his, his second single after Baby had like, I don't know, grown his hair out and got a guitar and been all folky and tried to be like Bob Dylan, we'd have been like, 
the hell's he doing? You know, he's because right. he's not going to suddenly win over a load of Bob Dylan fans, but he is going to alienate his core base. And I but have there's something special about that, though. There's something special about not being what everybody else wants you to do to be, right? One hundred percent, and that's probably what I was uh, aiming for, and that's what I've always tried to to do. But I think in the context of releasing a debut album at that age, when I'm 18 years old, the audience that I was going in search for uh, just was certainly not going to be receptive to me at that age. And I also probably wasn't mature enough in my songwriting and things. So I think I got stuck in a halfway house where right. I was trying to please one side and I was trying to please the other side. And I think like any form of art if you do that you're always going to dilute slightly and that's you're gonna a really good point to make it's almost like sometimes you have to adapt to a certain situation and own it for what it is yeah. so for example you're going to release an album you want some success at 18 years old maybe you do have to go down a different route to, to feed that but accept it for what it is but no like there's another part of you that's going to be a next stepping stone sure i think that's that's all and, I, and, and i'd be lying if i hadn't had those thoughts mm. subsequently but at the time, I the reason I'd never change it is because at the time I was so adamant that I was like, no, I have to write all the songs on the album. I have to play as many instruments as I can. I have to do this. I, even at the detriment of going, well, should we maybe look at, you know, let's find a big pop hit. And I was mm. like, no, wow. <laughs> it has to be like this. And that's all well and good knowing your own mind. And I've, been, I've always been proud of that. But at the same time, it's it's such a worthy pursuit to listen to people but, who are more experienced. But at the same time, if you did go down that route and then became this big pop star, you wouldn't have been happy. Like, I don't think you would have been happy. And I feel like no. where you are now, right, we just sat down before this interview and, you, and you're telling me about all these series that are coming out on Netflix, all these credible films that you're doing and everything else. Like, there's no way I don't think you would be where you are now if you made those other decisions. 100%. And, and I was offered those, I was offered those sort of, stereotypical record deals that the, the, we all know the people I'm referring to, the, which makes total sense. Again, I'm not being in any way derogatory. I totally fully understand that decision. It just wasn't for me, the kind of the template, like you've just won this, sing these songs, it'll go to number one, and in two years time, you're old news yeah. again. And rightly or wrongly, I always, because I'd seen my mum and dad do it for years, and they're still doing it now. You know, my mum and dad, uh, I wouldn't, dream of mentioning my mum's age, she'd never speak to me again. <laughs> but they're, they're of an age now and, uh, and they're still acting. And so for me, the longevity of a career was always worth so much more than the short the That's short. That's what you've always pursuit. done, you've always played the long game. That's what I want the lesson to be from this podcast, if I'm honest, is about the power and the importance of playing the long game. Like we all want things so quickly in this day and age. Mm. And I'm the same, like I'm waking up today overwhelmed and thinking, why am I not? as far as I want to be in certain my businesses, but I'm thinking, you know what? No, this is part of it. This yeah. is a process. Like, trust the process. Well, just to pick up on that point, I, I vividly remember a time when I'd done, I'd been to New York, I'd been on Broadway. It had been an incredible experience. I moved to LA for a while. I got signed with a big agent out there and I hated it. I was, I'd, I'd been away from home for a year doing this show. I was exhausted. I got to LA, I was like a fish out of water. I didn't know anyone. I, I guess maybe naively I expected to arrive in LA and, and be like, I've just played a lead on Broadway. I'm here, you know, world. And that's not how it works. Like if you're on the West Coast, they don't care what's happened on the East Coast. So it I- Sounds um, like some two pack of biggie shit. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I had um, I had a really, uh, don't get me wrong, again, it, I had life experiences for days. I, I was in an incredible place. I remember speaking to you about it and I was, I was having an amazing LA experience, but work-wise, it was not in any way uh, a successful trip. I ended up coming home and uh, I was a little bit out of sorts because I'd had this unbelievable meteoric couple of years where everything had just been just getting progressively better and more exciting and more amazing. And then you suddenly find, right, well, I'd given up my flat. I, I owned a place, but it was renting it out. So I'm back, literally back at my mom and dad's thinking, what's going on here? And then there was a few jobs coming in here and there. Again, they were good jobs, but they just weren't, they didn't seem like a progression. They didn't seem like the right thing. Or they might have felt a little bit like, yeah, but that seems so obvious for me to go mm. from ghost to that or whatever. And so there was quite a, a substantial amount of time that not a lot was happening. Mm. I was turning down jobs, but you never want to be the guy when someone goes, what are you up to? You go, well, I've just turned down three jobs. <laughs> You're just like, don't speak to him again. What an idiot, yeah. you know what I mean? So you just go, well, nothing at the minute, and I'm just figuring it out. 
And I remember being at Ryan's flat and uh, I came and, and you even said, you were like, so like, what is going on? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and it, I remember feeling so like, oof, this is tough. Cause mm. again, even to you, even to mm. my best mates, I wouldn't be like filling you in necessarily on the things, but it just didn't feel right. And also there's an element as well, if you try and protest too much, you know what? I am, I am wanted, I'm just not doing this thing. It just looks mm. desperate and then you saw there's a definite questioning period in yourself of going, am I making the right choices? Am I doing the right thing? So to sit here today is what I'm trying to say and hear you say what you just said. I look back over the last decade, okay, I'm like, wow, that's... Well, that's, that's the way I've always looked at you. If you're not working, I, don't, I think this guy fully backs himself, trusts in, in his ability and is willing to say no to opportunities aren't right. And if I'm honest, sometimes I feel like I'm spinning a lot of different plates at the moment and I'm always questioning myself going, am I being a jack of all trades and a master of none. And the fact that you just always knew like you were there, like, and I didn't know that you were questioning yourself. But for me, I think there's some serious strength and power in the fact that you could go through those times of having that meteoric success that you talked about, but then they're going up through those low moments. And I spoke to someone the other day and I said to him, how's business going? He went, just on the roller coaster, Scott. One minute it's like this, you think you're a millionaire, next minute you're down here again. And I think that's kind of what life is like for everyone. 100%. And I think on Instagram, social media, we see a highlight reel and I'm really trying to make it. I did a post the other day going, big salute to anyone who's in business because I might look like I'm living the dream right now, but life's tough. Yeah. Like life is tough. And I feel like for you to have that strength and willpower to still know who you are and say no to certain things when things weren't as busy as they might be. But like you said, you stay true to who you are and it's all coming to fruition now. And listen, there might be another time after this where it dips down, but as long as you know you're being you, yeah. then that, that's the power, right? Sure. And, and, and the insecurity never goes away. Like just the nature of being self-employed, being an entrepreneur like you are, like w when, when you're not reliant on the safety net of someone going, if you turn up to this place between these hours, we'll pay you this amount, right? That's a, mm. don't get me wrong, it's not for me, but the security and the safety of that mm. does seem appealing some days because I've just come back from this job, which was an incredible job. We were filming away for four and a half months. I'm super excited about it coming out. I'm playing, literally, the, I'm playing the, the, the pilot of a spaceship for, for, for <laughs> Dean Devlin, who's, who's uh, produced and wrote Independence Day. It's his new series. So I'm super excited about it. I come back home. And then you, you feel like- Normal you, again. You, yeah, <laughs> you feel like you're right back at the thing. And then suddenly you, okay, uh, I, I'm, gonna get some auditions for this and, and obviously we're still waiting to hear about season two so maybe that's maybe that's a maybe but you're constantly living with these question marks and what you just said about a highlight reel of life like most people's lives that we I don't even mean on Instagram I just mean most people's lives in our uh, vicinity that we, we know we all suffer from spotlight syndrome to a degree so no one cares as much about my downfalls and my insecurities and my successes as I do because no one's as aware of my mm. downfalls and my insecurities and successes as I am. Just the same with you. So I might look at you, even knowing you as well as I do, and I just see like what the, the, the peaks of the mountains, because yeah. that's the thing that's visual to everyone. But I don't know about your day-to-day -day worries, just as you don't know about mine, even though we're as close as we are. Yeah. And so if you extrapolate that out and you look at all your friendship groups and stuff, it's so unhealthy to constantly run a race against everyone because you just don't have any idea the struggles that people we are going do through. It more. Honestly, I had the same conversation. Um, I'm gonna mention him, Scott Sasha the other day. Yeah. We went to Ibiza and we all went on this trip and we're all over there and we're all doing all right. And we're, but we're all like, I'll get that bill. No, I'll get this. And I, and I actually came home a little bit deflated. <laughs> I went, oh my God, like everyone's smashing it. And at not one point did we all talk about how tough business is right now and everything else. And I got back and I just opened up to Scott in the car and said, Business is tough, I know, it's mate, it is tough. Like yeah. really, and it's like, and I said, I've just, I just, feel deflated after that IB trip. I know, mate, like, I don't know, I feel, I'm thinking, I'm finding it tough, is he finding it tough? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And like, why do we not just talk as friends yeah. and go? And it's like, I think when people talk about mental health and we say, talk about when it gets really bad, but no, just talk like honestly and openly on a day-to-day -day basis For about sure. how, not to be a drain on anyone, but I think, especially as men, we've got this facade to be super, I don't know, happy and, and confident and motivated all the time. And really, it's like, if we actually talked honestly and openly, we'd probably empower our friends more. 100%. I get there's been times when it's not been busy, but let's do a whistle um, stop tour now of like the highlights of your career because okay. there's been some incredible ones. And one that really stands out for me is when you launched Ghost, mm. um, the musical in the West End. And that was like, 
it makes me proud even now when I see your face still on the, like, the original like poster yeah. and obviously you, you did the original music and that was huge, right? That was a, that, and it's, it's still running today, is it? Uh, somewhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I, I did it, uh, it opened here in Manchester. Yeah, uh, that's like I came to the lawn. The, I, the press party was here in and this hotel. I'm not actually exaggerating, just saying because it was you. It's a great show. I think I might have seen it twice. I think yeah, once, it twice. was an amazing show. Like the, the team behind it was incredible. It was Glenn Ballard um, wrote a lot of the music with Dave Stewart as well. So the Eurythmics and Glenn wrote like Man in the Mirror for Michael Jackson. Do you know what, what I mean? Like unbelievable songs. And Matthew Ward just directed it. It was an amazing show. Uh, and obviously to get to originate a part like that, then we did it in the West End. It was a big hit. And then... It was gonna go to Broadway, they knew, but they didn't think they could take me because uh, I was English. So they were like, we're never gonna get you the visa, it's not gonna happen. And I was a bit gutted, you know, so the leading lady was gonna go over because she was Canadian, she lived in New York. And uh, so I was, I was pretty miserable for a, a time and they started bringing guys over from America to audition with her. And I was like, this is just ruthless, you know? And then I got a, a message from the director one morning saying, pack your bags, coming to NY. No way. And they'd fought and fought and fought uh, to somehow get me so this 22 year old kid over there to, to play. A, the, a Broadway like, star. And then yeah. I've heard some stories, I don't, don't quote me on this, but like obviously being in Broadway, like the caliber of people used to come and watch you perform there yeah. was on a different level. And I don't know if I'm right here, but did am I right in thinking Beyonce came? Yeah, Beyonce came, yeah. Beyonce came, and didn't she end up coming backstage? Yeah, she did, yeah. I remember I came off stage for the interval and the, the stage manager was like, oh, Richard, someone wants to say hello in the interval? And I was like, it's the interval. I said, we, they can wait to the end of the show. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> like, that's just not what people do. That, I'm not, wasn't being grand. That's just not what people, you have stuff to do. Right. And they went, it's Beyonce. I went, brilliant. Just, uh, <laughs> just tell her to come immediately backstage. That's no problem at all. Uh, oh my days. Yeah, and you know awesome. what? This is a credit to how incredible your life is. We've just like absolutely skipped through a massive milestone as well. <laughs> like you went on tour with Elton John. Yeah. Like after Soap Star Superstar, that was one of your biggest next moves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, so I got signed, released the album. And then one day my music manager called me up and was like, uh, Elton's heard the album, he'd like to invite you on tour. Which I was just like, I grew up listening to Elton, you know, he's my... He's your hero. Yeah, he was certainly one of them. And um, he was the first concert I ever went to at the MEN. And then we went on this tour and then he invited us out another couple of times. And uh, I finished one of the final gigs we did together was at the MEN. So me opening up on the same stage that I'd first watched my ever gig, which was Elton John, like, I don't know what it'd been like, 10 years before or something like that. So, yeah, it was pretty wild. I just can't even get my head around that you... And you became good friends with Elton John. Like, you, you invited you to a, a few parties. And yeah. I remember, like, little stories. You'd tell me, like, you saw, like, a, a ginger guy um, at this party, at Elton's party, <laughs> many years before he even launched. Oh, and, Rocket. And it, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. ended up being... Um, the one and only Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran, yeah. who was um, recently performing live at Ocean, <laughs> Ocean Beach. Beach. I, I saw that. Know. What a guy. But, like, I, again, it's just mind-blowing. Like, the circles and life that you've lived, like, LA, New York, London, West End, Broadway, like what a career. And then you've gone on to do some really credible stuff as well. Like for example, um, um, Company in the West End, yeah. which was um, a bit of a unique role for you. Like yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really throwing you out of your comfort zone. It was really sort of um, respected acting at a level that I know you've always wanted to be at and you absolutely smashed out of the park and you looked ridiculous by the way because <laughs> he was in great shape you've got to see some pictures from that from that uh, time of his life I was hungry for six months but it was yeah good. and you and you got nominated um for is it a Lawrence Olivier yeah, award Olivier, yeah. for best supporting actor like that is I remember you don't message me about much or talk about much and but that was special like, I think I it was it was a special uh, definitely I, I'd, I'd had things come along in the past you know Sexiest Male 2006 soap it was. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> did you win that? <laughs> yeah. Wow. That was so wrong when you think about it. I was a wow. 16 year old kid. That's amazing. Anyway, uh, so most awards don't bear talking about, but there was a couple that were always, always, you know, no one's going to be like derogatory about an Oscar or a Grammy or something like that. They're the upper echelons, but f in the theatre world, a Tony and a Laurence Olivier are as big as it gets. So for me, that was a real moment, you know. I didn't even know I was in with the running, to be honest with you. I didn't even know. I was on set filming for Four Weddings and a Funeral and my phone dinged. And I'm not like you, mate. I've not got like millions of, of dings a day going off. I'm, I have a, a couple, this me mom and Celinda mainly, do you know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> suddenly my phone was just going, exploding. I was like, what the hell's going on? And then I found out I'd been nominated. So that was a really, yeah, that was a really nice experience. That's just incredible. And, and I think that was a moment as well where it kind of kick-started 
another level to your career now, which and I don't know if I feel like in lockdown, lockdown, like you said, you went far in lockdown and, and it was tough. But then coming out of lockdown, you've not stopped working. Like wow. literally from show to show. And we're talking big, credible stuff like Netflix series we talked about before, Sandman, which is one of the biggest watched uh, viewed shows on Netflix. Yeah. Um, you've done the gallery. You've got just done Ark, which is like a big sci-fi thing. Yeah, the Ark, yeah. Um, it's out in January. Right. What else are you? What else have you been doing? Um, I did Chivalry. It was uh, Steve Coogan's yeah. new comedy series. Yeah, with uh, Sarah Solmani and Sienna Miller, and um, and then what else? Rise, four, of, Rise of the Damned. Rise of the Damned. That year. Uh, four weddings. Uh, you said you did that. Was that a while ago? Four weddings was before lockdown. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm forgetting one. Hang on. Uh, oh, I did the that Christmas film. Yeah, the Christmas Vincent, film, which yeah. I watched, which was great. Is it like that? Yeah, yeah, you played American in it. Yeah. You've always been good at accents. But like, literally, like, how does it feel now to have that kind of... Do you think there's been a moment... I think there's a moment in everyone's career where something just... The domino effect starts, and it, and it seems to have started to happen for you where the work just is on a bit of a constant conveyor belt. belt. I'm not, I don't want to jinx it. Yeah, I know yeah, it's yeah. not always like that. Yeah. But it does feel like something's happened. Well... I think maybe it's it could be age, it could be experience, it could be f maybe f eventually get into a position within the industry where you're thought of in a different way than I might have previously been thought of. I don't know the exact reason for it. I'm, I'm, I've been super grateful the last few years have been really, really good. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's no, the, the, the only thing I'd say is like, if you, if you take a minute to be objective and a lot of us aren't about our own lives, you know, to look back at it, there are certain links in the chain. If you if you take any of them out, you go, oh, I wouldn't be here now, for good or for bad. And so that's that's quite nice to realize and, and look back and think, actually, that thing I had sleepless nights over or that thing I was devastated about or whatever, it didn't work out so bad in the end. Or, or even going as far as there's jobs you don't get and you might have had your heart set on it. You might have worked so hard and you've auditioned so many times or, or whatever that experience might be. And that doesn't happen. And then three months later, you get something and you go, Wow! If I was doing that, this is so much better. Or this, or this met that amazing friend, or this met my relationship, and I wouldn't have met them if I'd have got that job. So everything's kind of you can find a route through it 100%. that is incredibly cathartic. That you go, actually, it's good to just realise that in ten years' time, if you look back, there'll be a reason. You know, I'm not being I'm not being sort of lardy da. I'm not saying everything happens for a reason. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think, but within everything. You can find you can retroactively find mm. the good that came out of every experience. Hundred percent, and I feel like, if I'm honest, what you just said earlier about are you actually being perceived in the way that you actually thought of more often in this? I think that's what's happened, if I'm honest. And I think because you played the long game, you stayed true to who you are, and you've become that credible actor, musician that I think you've always wanted to be without. With taking into consideration, you did do a few commercial bits along the way, like your comedy streets, yeah. your soap star superstars. But in a way, I feel like where you are now is probably where you always want to be. And I always say to myself, when I drive past my old school, and I, and I, I talk to my little Scott in, in the window, because I used to stare out the window, I remember doing it, and I see the road, and I go, what would he think now of me driving yeah. past? Would he be proud? And I think, you know what? On those tough days, when I do doubt myself, I think, you know what? He'd be proud. Very proud. proud. And I feel very like... Proud. I sent you that text message not so long ago. I actually said, imagine that however many, I don't know what age I said. Yeah, you but did. imagine if he could see your life. Because I know, I knew you then. And yeah. I know what you'd have said if you drove by, driving yeah. your car, yeah. wearing your clothes, yeah. looking like you. He'd have been like, who's that guy? Yeah. And uh, that's a really, it's a really healthy way of looking at it. Because it's very sweet of you to say what you just said. And I really appreciate it. But that's not how I view my career at mm. all. Like, I don't feel... I'm anywhere near whatever that destination. I don't think there is a destination, but I'm not. I'm, I'm certainly. But I would like to think I'm on the right trajectory, yeah. but I don't think I'm anywhere near where I'd love to be. Uh, and that d again, I'm not referring to like money or fame or anything. I'm talking about there's a potential. I think one of the I think one of the scariest things in life you can feel uh, fear about is is not, is unfulfilled potential. Mm. I think that's my main fear. I never I never really worry about. Uh, age per se, but you, I worry about missed opportunities in the sense that I would, I would hate to be lying on a inverted commas, you know, a deathbed one day and thinking, 
I had this opportunity or I had this potential and I never fulfilled it. I think that's a really scary thought. I'd much rather regret things I've done than things I haven't done, mm. you know. Um, but going back to what I was saying, I think I would like to think I'm, I'm closer to that trajectory that where I could be like, yeah, I've, I'm proud of myself. Mm. That's probably it. It's, it's being proud of myself and having, and, and, and having integrity and going like, I'm proud of that decision I made. I'm proud of that job. I'm proud of that work. I'm proud of how people responded to it. It's not always going to go well. Like, mm. of the seven or eight jobs we just mentioned this year, some of them went really well. Sandman, <laughs> it did really well. There'll be others, right? You were, uh, you, you'll be like, I'll be like, did you see that? You'll be like, mm-hmm. You know, like, that's going to happen. Yeah. So you just have to be, it's, and, and, and creating things, and I don't even mean in an artistic way, in your line of work, you've got to throw things at the wall sometimes yeah. and see what sticks, and not everything's going to stick. 100%. But the, the joy has to come out of going, um, this is what I have to offer in this allotted time frame. This is how much effort I'm going to give it, hopefully everything. Mm. And this is the result. And then you move on and you mm. see what the next thing in line is. I think is. that's really interesting. I think I'm most proud of myself when I know I'm doing my best. And that's why I really do beat myself up if, say, I don't drink often now, but if I'm hungover, I think because I value productivity so much yeah. and I know I'm going to be off my game for a week, like that's when I do beat myself up because I'm like, I'm not operating at my best. As long as like now, this week, and even though I'm overwhelmed, a bit tired because loads of, I'm just spinning so many different plates. I'm like, do you know what? Like I booked in tonight, I'm going for a steam and sauna at David Lloyd, which you're welcome to come to. Like I booked well, that, that in actually. and I know I deserve that. I know there's no like debating that I deserve that rest and that time for myself tonight because I've worked so hard. Yeah. And that's when I can find balance. And I think as long as I'm operating my best, that's when I feel proudest and happiest, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I think that becomes really important as well. The, the feeling of everyone deserves to let their hair down. Everyone deserves a holiday. Everyone, you know, I'm, listen, I, I can still open a pack of cookies <laughs> and uh, I'd play PlayStation if that's how I feel. But there's nothing better than, than doing that when I feel I've earned it. There's nothing better than a bit of resistance in life. The reason we go to the gym, me and my partner, we go to the gym as much as we do is because life shouldn't be too easy all the time. There should be resistance. You should have the endorphins that a little bit of a workout or a hard work or whatever that thing is for you. Mm. I'm not saying it has to be a workout or in the gym. It could be a run. It could be whatever it is that gives you that resistance in the day to go, I achieved something today. Even if the rest of my day was a little bit down or a little bit dull or whatever, I did something that actually I can feel Amazing. good about. And that's, uh, that's, that's important as well. No, I love that. So obviously when we've been talking about milestones, um, there's been so many different highlights, but obviously I know how much of a massive fan you are of Sting. <laughs> and there was that period of your life when you when you worked with him, what was that like and how did that unfold? Yeah, that was that was really, really cool. Uh, I've been a lifelong fan of Sting. Um, and and then the opportunity to come and do The Last Ship, which is his, his show, kind of, uh, sort of semi-autobiographical, but not really, uh, but he wrote the music to it. And he was fully involved and uh, I went into the final audition for that and he was there. And, <laughs> and uh, subsequently got to know him really well and, and we actually taught, like, did a tour around the country and, and uh, sang together a lot, which was <laughs> insane. But the audition was even weirder because I had to sing one of his songs to him, which was just so surreal, do you know what I mean? Um, but he's, he's, he's just an amazing guy, I, like fiercely intelligent, crazy talented and, and was super, super lovely. So um, uh, yeah, again, just an amazing takeaway, something I'm, I'm incredibly proud of. You just lived a very first-rate life, um, and I take it back to a scene in Meet Joe Black. Have you seen the film Meet Joe Black? Yeah, of course. When um, Brad Pitt says, and Anthony Hopkins says, "Why I mean," he goes, "Well, you've lived a first-class life," and I feel like you really have lived a first-class life Thanks, in terms man. of the way that you've just stuck to your guns. You've learned so many different skills and talents, and you perfected your craft, and you played the long game, and you've just you live life to the full. And um, I think my biggest takeaway from this podcast with you is to anyone listening is don't be scared to play the long game. Don't be scared to stay true to who you are and learn the power of saying no. I think that's one of been your biggest skill. Like you yeah. said, it's not about necessarily knowing exactly who you are, but knowing who you're not. And I think, I think it's, that's a step in the right direction. It's definitely much easier to decipher who you're not than it is. I still wouldn't be able to tell you who I am exactly, but I'm instantaneously able to tell you what I'm not. And I think that's a good that's a Well, good I'm going to go. tell you, you're a great guy and you smash life. Uh, I love so you, thank man. you so much. Thanks for having me on, brother. Oh.